Nobody thinks that these six Pokemon are good. But your wording was, my team is atrocious and none of my friends will touch it with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> uh oh. So why did I bring them to a tournament with over 700 players? Did I really think that I could win with such underwhelming power? Yes, yes I did. So I rolled up to the Charlotte Regional Championships and sat down to play my first match to prove that not all Pokemon that are bad are bad. But right out of the gates, I am met with a problem. Indeedee and Armourouge. These two provide a near guaranteed setup of the move Trick Room, which reverses the order in which Pokemon attack, and then output huge psychic type damage with Armourouge's move Expanding Force. For my team, which lacked answers for both, this was a big problem. To my surprise, my opponent leads with Great Tusk and Ndidi into my Fluttermane and Espothra. Espothra is the first of our bad Pokemon, but I thought it had potential. Its ability Speed Boost makes it faster at the end of every turn, and its signature move, Lumina Crash, causes future special attacks to do twice as much damage to whatever it hits. And that's exactly what I do here. Lumina Crash and Moonblast immediately removes Ndidi, stopping Trick Room from going up. In comes Armor Rouge, but Lumina Crash and Moonblast KO that too, though Great Tusk takes out Fluttermane. I send out Ledge and they send out Amoongus, and I switch in my Gyarados as they try to hit it with a ground type attack, KO the Amoongus with Bitter Blade, and win game one. But every match in this tournament is a best of three. I need to win another game, and now my opponent has a better idea of what to expect. For game two, they adjust and lead off with Ndidi and Amoongus. It's time to show what makes my Fluttermane unique. Fluttermane is normally trained to be fast and strong and holds an item that boosts its damage or a focus sash to keep it alive. But the way I'm using Fluttermane is completely unconventional. I've given it the leftovers item and trained it completely in its speed and defenses without any special attack. This totally changes the way that Fluttermane plays and turns it from a strong Pokemon that threatens KOs to a bulky Pokemon that's pretty hard to remove. In this game too, my opponent is threatening Rage Powder and Trick Room, and there's no way for me to stop it. I decide to use Substitute to help me stall out my opponent's Trick Room, and I hit Amoongus with Lumina Crash, which nearly takes it out but they don't go for Rage Powder and instead use Spore to put Espothra to sleep as they set up Trick Room. Indeed, he switches out for Armor Rouge and tries to hit my Espothra with Pollen Puff to break its Focus Ash, but I switch into Sarah Ledge and KO Amoongus. But here's where things get tricky. My opponent brings in King Gambit, another massive problem for my team. I switch Espothra out and it faints to Expanding Force and Kowtow Cleave, but Expanding Force breaks my Substitute and Shadow Ball just barely doesn't KO Armor Rouge. I go back into Sarah Ledge. Now, ordinarily, Sarah Ledge would have absolutely no chance of surviving a double attack from King Gambit and Armor Rouge, but my Sarah Ledge is quite unusual. First, its Terra type is Grass, which allows me to turn off my weakness to Dark type attacks. Second, it's holding the Assault Vest. This item dramatically increases its special defense stat, which in turn allows it to take expanding force much better. I have trained my Sarah Ledge very heavily in its defense stat, something no other Sarah Ledge has even considered, but it's what will make the difference here. Kowtow Cleave comes out, but it only does 45%. Expanding force, thanks to the Assault Vest, should only do 50%. I feel great until I see the three words every Pokemon player hates. A critical hit. Armor Rouge lands a critical hit expanding force, taking out Sarah Ledge. Fluttermane finishes off Armor Rouge, but the damage is done. Indeedee comes in as I'm forced into Gyarados, and Gyarados' Intimidate ability activates King Gambit's Defiant ability, giving it an attack boost. I've got a low HP Fluttermane and a Gyarados staring down a full HP Ndidi and a boosted King Gambit with one turn left of Trick Room. Getting out of this one would take some immaculate play. So let's give it a shot. Fluttermane is so vulnerable, so I predict them to predict me to protect and go for a Moonblast and protect with Gyarados. I get the call right, blocking Helping Hand Kowtow Cleave into my Gyarados. I predict a Follow Me from Ndidi and go for Substitute and Waterfall as they go for Follow Me and a Terrifier Kowtow Cleave into Gyarados, who barely survives. I've put myself in a position where it's possible to win. All I need to do is predict when King Gambit Sucker Punches and when it doesn't. I predict Sucker Punch and go for Protect and Moonblast, but the King Gambit instead targets down Fluttermane, breaking the Substitute. Thanks to the Fire Typing, King Gambit really doesn't want to take a Waterfall, and a Sucker Punch will easily KO Gyarados. 
Knowing this, I go for a double protect. Sucker Punch will only deal damage if I click Waterfall. Not only do I fail the double protect, but my opponent makes an extremely aggressive prediction and goes for Kowtow Cleave, finishing off Gyarados. Fluttermane can't deal enough damage and I lose the second game. I need to win game three. I lead off with Fluttermane and Sarah Ledge, but my opponent switches it up, going with Great Tusk and King Gambit. Realizing how much trouble the King Gambit gave me last game, I go for a Protect with my Fluttermane and Terra Grass close combat into King Gambit, but King Gambit switches out into Ndidi as Great Tusk attacks into Protect. I'm scared of Trick Room going up, so I double attack into the Ndidi, but it switches into Armor Rouge, who takes very little from my Moonblast. And, to my surprise, close combat KOs my Sarah Ledge. I'm shocked. My Sarah Ledge is so bulky. How is it possible it fainted? It turns out this Great Tusk had a nature that boosted its attack rather than one that boosted speed, which is more common. Assuming it was also fully invested in its attack stat, it only had a 43% chance to KO. I bring in a Spothra, and I feel like I need to make a play to win, so I go for Hypnosis into Great Tusk, but I miss. Shadow Ball KOs Armor Rouge, but Great Tusk KOs Fluttermane in return. It's all down to Sandy Shocks and Aspothra. I go for Protect and another Hypnosis, and this time I hit the Ndidi as Great Tusk attacks into the Protect. I go for Lumina Crash into Great Tusk, but they switch to King Gambit, who's immune. Earth Power does a good chunk to Ndidi. I can still win this as long as the Ndidi stays asleep. My Aspothra's final move is Low Kick, specifically for King Gambit. I launch Low Kick and Earth Power into King Gambit, but Ndidi wakes up. Follow Me causes it to take both attacks and faint, but King Gambit drops his Pothra to 1 HP, and the Psychic Terrain ends, meaning Sucker Punch can now be used. It's 2 against 2. I make a prediction. King Gambit is not going to Sucker Punch. I go for Low Kick and Earth Power, but it doesn't KO. Even against extremely bulky King Gambit, the odds of this double up KOing are 66% and against the normal amount of bulk on King Gambit, the odds are near guaranteed. King Gambit surviving means this battle is over, and though I flounder around, I have no more hope of winning. I lose game three and the first set of the day. But before we continue with the tournament, I'd like to take a second and tell you about the sponsor of today's video. Holzkern is an Austrian-based company that makes really unique jewelry and watches. If you know me, you know that I love watches. I think they're a great blend of function and fashion, and overall, I just think they look classy. And I really like Holzkern's watches, so much so that I wear one almost every single day. This is my main everyday one, but I like this one for when I want to get a little more dressed up. Their pieces use stone, wood, and mother of pearl, which makes every watch unique due to the grain and marbling. And watches aren't the only products that they have. Before Holzkern, I didn't wear jewelry very often but I like the pieces they sent me so much that it's become part of my everyday look. Having used their products myself for months now, I can say personally that you'll be very happy with the quality should you choose to purchase something. Holzkern offers free shipping worldwide and delivers to the US and most of Europe in two to five business days. If you're interested in checking out Holzkern, you can click the link in the description and use my discount code WOLFIE15 to get 15% off and a special gift worth 15 euros. Thanks again to Holzkern, now back to the tournament. It's not a good way to start the tournament. I worked really hard on this team, but there's no denying that it's really out there, and a loss this early doesn't exactly inspire confidence. If I want to make it out of this first day of competition, I need to win 7 of the 9 rounds. In this round 2, my opponent leads with Arcanine and Great Tusk, and I lead off with Tinkaton and Fluttermane. Now, Tinkaton hasn't been used on any serious teams, but I thought that it could shine. It's a good support Pokemon, with its great defensive typing and access to the moves Thunder Wave, Fake Out, and Faint. Plus, it can still do good damage with the super-powered Gigaton Hammer. I start the battle off with a hard read, doubling Great Tusk with Fake Out and Moonblast as Arcanine switches into Hydreigon and Great Tusk Terra Grounds to survive the Onslaught. With Terastalization used, I target down Hydreigon with Moonblast, picking up an easy KO while I switch in my Gyarados. Gyarados and Tinkaton have amazing switching synergy. Tinkaton is only weak to fire and ground attacks, both of which Gyarados resists. Plus, Tinkaton resists the rock moves aimed at Gyarados. And Gyarados' Intimidate shores up both of their physical defense stats. With the Intimidate here, Great Tusk doesn't even do 50% to Fluttermane. Iron Bundle comes out, and I protect and switch in Tinkaton as they switch in Arcanine. The good news is the Freeze Dry does almost no damage to Tinkaton. The bad news is it freezes. I switch back into Gyarados and hit Iron Bundle with Moonblast, as they miss both Hydro Pump and Will-O-Wisp. With this, everything is set up. 
I protect and bring in Sarah Ledge. Arcanine switches into Great Tusk, while I substitute and Shadow Sneak to KO the Iron Bundle. Moonblast finishes off Tusk as Waterfall KOs Arcanine and I win game one. But my opponent makes a Pokemon adjustment for game two, leading off with Brute Bonnet and Iron Bundle. After a first turn filled with Protects, they freeze dry my Tinkaton, predicting Gyarados to switch in, and I go for Thunder Wave and Substitute causing their Spore into my Fluttermane to fail. Tinkaton's Feint breaks Iron Bundle's Protect, allowing Fluttermane to KO it. Unfortunately, Brute Bonnet puts Tinkaton to sleep. King Gambit enters the field, and we enter a stalemate for several turns. Eventually, my opponent switches in Hydreigon, and they think that they can get away with leaving it vulnerable since switching it out is so obvious, but I just Moonblast it, putting me in the lead 4-2. I eventually KO Brute Bonnet with Gigaton Hammer and Shadow Ball. And though King Gambit KOs my Fluttermane in return, it now has nothing for Sarah Ledge, winning me the set. I'm feeling better. After losing, it's really important to take some clean wins so you can start to rebuild your confidence. Confidence that won't be shaken by anything. They're right behind me, aren't they? This is not a popular archetype at this tournament. I expected to maybe play against two the entire tournament, not to play against two out of the first three rounds. I know now that if I want to win against this team, I have to take some risks. Armorusion and DD stare down my Espathra and Fluttermane at the start of game one. I go for a 60% accurate hypnosis, and I hit the Ndidi who used Follow Me as Armorouge sets up Trick Room. They launch an expanding force, but Lumina Crash and Shadow Ball pick up a KO, giving me a tenuous lead as they bring in their Brute Bonnet. Without Armorouge, they no longer have a way to stop Sarah Ledge. I sacrifice Espathra, get it in, terrestrialize it to protect it from Spore, and clean up the game without incident. All right, listen here, you freaking viewer. We are less than 4,000 subscribers away from 1 million. I'm not gonna ask again. Please, please subscribe, we're so close. Come on, let's just finish this right in here right now. Come on, please, just subscribe, please. Game two opens up with the exact same leads. I really hate gambling on Hypnosis' accuracy, so I decide to make an aggressive play. I go for Lumina Crash and Shadow Ball into Armor Rouge. If NDD does anything other than click follow me, this might win me the game immediately. Unfortunately, NDD does click follow me, giving them a free trick room as my Shadow Ball does nothing. I dance around a little and KO and DD, but that just gives my opponent a switch to Torkoal. I can't handle the powerful spread damage of Eruption and Expanding Force, and I quickly lose the game. I'm a little surprised that my opponent went for the exact same play as Game 1, given that if I'd hit Hypnosis, they would've just lost immediately. That's why I expected them to make a different play in Game 2. And then it hits me. Their adaptation to my Hypnosis play is just to hope that I miss. It starts out with the same leads once again. I lock in Substitute and Hypnosis as they launch Follow Me. Just like Game 1, Hypnosis connects, and though Trick Room goes up, Armor Rouge is incredibly vulnerable. I take it out turn 2, and with only Sleeping in DD, a Torkoal who can't damage Sarah Ledge, and Brute Bonnet, Sarah Ledge easily cleans up the game. I somehow manage to survive another in DD and Armor Rouge player. I'm in complete disbelief over how bad my pairings lock is, but at least it's finally over. I lead off with Espathra and Fluttermane, but my opponent leads with Mousehold and Brute Bonnet. I read Mousehold to protect and go for Hypnosis into Brute Bonnet, which connects, as Fluttermane sets up a substitute. I KO the Mousehold the next turn with a double attack, as Brute Bonnet takes another turn of sleep. Armor Rouge comes in and protects, as Ndidi switches in, as I double into the Armor Rouge. I go for Lumina Crash and Moonblast into Ndidi, but it survives and goes for Dazzling Gleam as Trick Room goes up. I go for Protect and Hypnosis as Ndidi switches out to Brute Bonnet and Hypnosis connects and puts Armor Rouge to sleep. I'm so close to winning. I go for Shadow Ball into Armor Rouge, but it survives and I lose my Espathra to Brute Bonnet. Gyarados comes out and I still feel like I'm in good shape, except not only does the Armor Rouge wake up after just one turn of sleep, it lands a critical hit on Gyarados knocking it out from full HP. With Armor Rouge surviving this turn, I can't handle Armor Rouge and Brute Bonnet, and I lose the first game. To be honest, I knew I really had to clutch up at this point, so my notes aren't really that good on this game too. All I can tell you is that the Pokemon we both brought are the same, only this time I make better calls with Espathra, taking out Mousehold early and then focusing down Brute Bonnet before it can really cause trouble. I win the game, and it's once again down to game three. I don't really love leading Espathra and Fluttermane into Brute Bonnet and Mousehold, 
I'd much rather lead Gyarados. The thing is, if I lead with Gyarados and they do switch to Indeedee and Arm Rouge, I'll probably lose immediately. I can't risk it. I stick with Espothra and Fluttermane. And they lead Indeedee and Arm Rouge. That was very nearly disastrous. I can't stop Tricker from going up, but Substitute and Espothra slow my opponent down considerably. I stall at the Trick Room and position Sarah Ledge properly, allowing me to take vital KOs and eventually win the game. I'm half expecting another Ndidi and Arm Rouge team given my luck thus far, but instead I'm faced with a different familiar team. My Knoxville Regionals Iron Jugulus team. Now, I'm the one who built this team, but just because you created a team, it doesn't mean that it's easy to beat. I lead off with Tinkaton and Fluttermane into Goldengo and Gothitelle. I go for Substitute and Thunder Wave into Goldengo, as Goldengo breaks the sub with Make It Rain and Gothitelle sets up Trick Room. I predict Goldengo to switch out and choose not to Terrastalize, instead targeting Gothitelle with Thunder Wave and Shadow Ball. Unfortunately, Tinkaton gets Charmed, lowering its damage output by a ton. They double attack into my Protect as a Gigaton Hammer, but Gothitelle just barely survives. I switch to Seraledge and faint the Gothitelle, but it barely survives that too, and Seraledge takes a ton from the double up. I try and KO Gothitelle with Shadow Sneak, but they switch it out into Great Tusk and KO my Seraledge. I go back into Fluttermane and switch Tinkaton out into Gyarados, but they launch a Wild Charge and a Terra Ground Headlong Rush at that slot, and the Wild Charge KOs Gyarados. I do get a substitute up, but I'm now down two against four. I make an aggressive play, predicting Great Tusk to protect and doubling up into Iron Hands. But Great Tusk doesn't protect, and instead KOs Tinkaton with Headlong Rush. I get the next turn correct, KOing Great Tusk with Moonblast, and then trade my substitute for a KO on Iron Hand. The end of the game comes down to Paralyzed Gothitelle with low HP and full HP Paralyzed Goldengo against my healthy Fluttermane. I have three shots at either Pokemon getting paralyzed. If I get a single one, I win. I Terra Steel and launch a Shadow Ball at Goldengo, doing 70%. Goldengo isn't paralyzed, and Shadow Ball drops me below half HP. If Gothadel fails Trick Room, I win, but it doesn't. It's okay, I have one final shot. Gothadel launches a Psychic, but that doesn't matter. Will Goldengo attack through Paralysis? It does. I lose game one. Game two, I lead with Seraledge and Fluttermane into Goldengo and Iron Jugulus. They go for a Tailwind and make it rain, as I go for a Terra Steel Moonblast into Jugulus and Bitter Blade into Goldengo. The next turn, I KO both with Shadow Sneak and Moonblast, putting me in the lead four against two. My opponent's final two Pokemon are Iron Hands and Iron Bundle. This game should be mine. However, I make a horrible play, switching Fluttermane into Gyarados as my opponent doubles up into Seraledge. KOing it. They then Terra Grass their Iron Hands, and my three remaining Pokemon have no way of damaging it. I lose the game and the set. Now I need to win the next four sets in a row in order to advance to the next day. More than that, it's really embarrassing to lose to a team that I built, especially given that I lost because I just made a really bad play. Because I feel so out of it, I don't bother taking any notes for round six, just focusing on the games. I do win cleanly, with two wins and zero losses, and I'm feeling a bit better going into round seven. It's an Espothra and Sandy Shocks mirror match. Oh yeah, I haven't actually explained Sandy Shocks yet. You already know that my Espothra has Hypnosis, which is a 60% accurate move, but in this instance, it pairs really well with Sandy Shocks, who gets the move Gravity, which increases the accuracy of all moves. Under Gravity, Hypnosis will always connect and paves the way for the duo to do massive damage on the next turn. The interesting thing is what happens when two Sandy Shocks Espothra teams play against one another. Both want gravity up for their own hypnosis, but neither wants to give the opponent 100% accurate hypnosis either. It's a matchup I didn't bother practicing, and I'm very nervous because my Espothra is actually one point below its maximum speed value. A point I didn't think would matter in any other matchup, but might just cause me to be slower here. Espothra Fluttermane versus my opponent, Espothra and Mimikyu. I protect Espothra from fear of a double attack from Shadow Sneak and Lumina Crash, but to my surprise, my opponent also uses Protect, and it moves after my own, which means that their Espothra is also not max speed. My Fluttermane Terra steals and sets up a substitute before Mimikyu can taunt it. I try to KO Spothra with Lumina Crash and Shadow Ball, but to my shock, they Terra Steel and actually survive. This is an incredibly defensive Espothra. I read Espothra to protect, doubling into Mimikyu to KO it as Espothra does nothing. They send out their Sandy Shocks. 
I KO their Espothra with Lumina Crash and protect against Sandy Shocks' Earth Power. Sarina is their final Pokemon. I sacrifice Espothra to get special defense drops on the Sandy Shocks, and I survive a desperate Earth Power before finishing it off. Left with only Sarina, there's no way for my opponent to beat the Serilege I saved in the back all game. Game two, my opponent brings Iron Bundle Mimikyu into my same lead. I take out the Mimikyu with a double attack, same as last time, and hit Bundle with a Moonblast to drop it low while avoiding major damage. Just like last game, I prioritize getting rid of the Sandy Shocks, and once it drops, there's no way for Serena to beat Serilege, sealing the outcome in my favor. Two rounds left to go, and I need to win both of them in order to advance. My next opponent's team is my least favorable matchup other than Ndidi and Armor Rouge. Palafin is incredibly powerful, and my options of either damaging it or stopping its ridiculous damage output are both, well, limited. Luckily for me, game one, my opponent brings Goldengo, Iron Hands, Amoongus, and Arcanine. These four Pokemon are strong, but not a single one can damage my super bulky Serilege once I terrestrialize, thanks to the healing from Bitter Blade. There's nothing they can do, and I win without much issue. But game two is nowhere near as easy. They lead off with Dragonite and Iron Hands into my Espathra and Fluttermane. The Dragonite is clear amulet and multi-scale, with Dragon Dance and Protect. Because the Dragonite has a multi-scale, I totally space out, and I forget that I can't intimidate it thanks to the clear amulet. So I switch to Gyarados and Moonblast. They Terra Flying and Dragon Dance, taking almost no damage from the Moonblast and boosting their attack and speed, and while charging my Fluttermane for 40% of its health. This Dragonite is about to run over my entire team, so I need to make a play. In this matchup, I almost always try and save my Terrastalization for Serilege to make sure that I don't lose to Palafin. However, here, they didn't lead with Palafin, and I'm about to lose to this Dragonite, so I choose an extremely risky Terra Flying with Gyarados. Not only do I lose the ability to Terra Grass my Serilege later, I also just gave up my only resistance to water. Predicting Dragonite to attack into Fluttermane, I protect and target it with Terra Blast. I get the read correct, and I drop Dragonite to 10%, as Iron Hands' Volt Switch hits Gyarados. I'm feeling good, until I see which Pokemon switched in. Palafin, turning this game from doable to near impossible right away. I realize Serilege is a lot less useful now since it can't do anything in front of Palafin, so I switch it in for Fluttermane as I launch another Terra Blast at Dragonite. But Dragonite protects, and Palafin switches back into Iron Hands. Next time Palafin enters the field, it will be full HP and transformed. I read Dragonite to switch out from Pressure of the Shadow Sneak and use the opportunity to Bitter Blade Iron Hands and switch in my Fluttermane as Dragonite goes out into Arcanine. We jostle for position for a bit and end up with Palafin next to Iron Hands against my Serilege at minus one attack and healthy Fluttermane. I predict Palafin to target Flutter and protect. The good news is I'm right and they double my Fluttermane. The bad news is minus one close combat only does 20% to Palafin. I bring in Gyarados for the Intimidate, allowing Fluttermane to survive the Jet Punch, and Moonblast drops them to low HP. They reset Palafin by sacrificing the Dragonite they saved earlier, and use Iron Hands to KO my Gyarados. But I still have full HP Espothra in the back, with Focus Sash still intact. I make the obvious play of attacking both of their low HP Pokemon, and my opponent, afraid a Protect would be punished by a substitute from Fluttermane, attacks, and loses both Pokemon because of it. Palafin with low HP cannot handle a two against one, and I win the game and the set. There's only one round left now, and it's gonna be on stream, adding on to the pressure. My opponent's team is very strange. They have Rabska, a Pokemon that can revive a single fainted team member. And this Rabska is holding the Bright Powder item, which gives all of my moves a 10% chance to miss. Hopefully that doesn't happen, haha. <laughs> The battle opens up with Fluttermane and Torkoal against Fluttermane and Espathra. There, Fluttermane gets a speed boost from the sun, so I protect both my Pokemon to scout for a protect and to give Espathra a speed boost. I'm a little surprised that Torkoal doesn't protect in front of the threat of a double up, so I decide to double it with Lumina Crash and Shadow Ball, taking it out in exchange for Espathra getting dropped to 1 HP. Assault Vest Great Tusk hits the field, and I'm not convinced that if it Terras, Lumina Crash and Shadow Ball will KO it. I sacrifice Espothra to break Fluttermane's Focus Sash instead, and bring in Serilege. Turn, their Fluttermane is in range of Shadow Sneak. Unfortunately, it switches out for Rabska. I bring in Gyarados, weakening the Great Tusk, and Shadow Sneak connects with Rabska, doing a little damage as Great Tusk's Earthquake does almost nothing. Gyarados now has a safe Dragon Dance, 
and once Sun ends next turn, it can outspeed and KO everything left with Waterfall. Sarah Ledge threatens Rapska with Bitter Blade, and my opponent can't Terrastalize or Protect, nor can they KO Sarah Ledge with Great Tusk thanks to the Intimidate. But if Bitter Blade is affected by that 10% Bright Powder chance and misses, Rabska can revive Torkoal and prevent my Gyarados from winning the game. Crossing my fingers, Gyarados gets a Dragon Dance up as Great Tusk hits Sarah Ledge with Ice Spinner. And Sarah Ledge connects with Rabska. It faints, and the sun ends. And I'm in the lead three against two. From here, Gyarados easily cleans up the game, but I need to win one more. Last time, my opponent led with Fluttermane and Torkoal, so I decide to counter that lead. Unfortunately, my opponent goes with Fluttermane and King Gambit, which hits both my Pokemon for super effective damage. I make a defensive play, going for Substitute and Terra Grass, as the opposing Fluttermane Shadow Balls Sarah Ledge and does almost no damage. But much to my chagrin, it drops its special defense stat. Sarah Ledge takes half of King Gambit's HP, but it goes for a Sword Stance, doubling its attack. If I don't get rid of King Gambit quickly, it'll easily KO all of my Pokemon. King Gambit is slower than Sarah Ledge, and I can KO it with Bitter Blade, but King Gambit has Sucker Punch, and with the boost, it will KO my Sarah Ledge with a combo attack from Fluttermane. I can use Shadow Sneak to get around this, as Shadow Sneak will move before Sucker Punch, causing it to fail. But if they predict this and use Kowtow Cleave, I'll lose my Sarah Ledge. I decide to read the Sucker Punch. Shadow Sneak comes out, and Sucker Punch fails. Fluttermane is dropped low, but it fires off another Shadow Ball, which once again drops my special defense stat. Moonblast into the King Gambit takes it into the red. From this position, the Shadow Sneak is incredibly safe. It stops both Fluttermane from attacking and Sucker Punch, but I have a sense that my opponent wants to switch out Fluttermane. Even though it didn't come last game, I just get this feeling Amoongus specifically is gonna switch in. So I make the incredibly risky play of using Bitter Blade into Fluttermane. And Amoongus switches in. King Gambit breaks the substitute with Sucker Punch, but it gets KO'd by Moonblast as Amoongus drops low from the Bitter Blade. Great Tusk is sent out, but Great Tusk is abysmal into Gyarados. I switch it in and KO Amoongus with Shadow Ball as Great Tusk's Ice Spinner just barely tickles Gyarados. The damaged Fluttermane is sent out and I'm up four against two. I protect Gyarados and bring in Sarah Ledge. And unfortunately for my opponent, their protect and headlong rush into the switch in sets them impossibly far behind. Shadow Sneak KOs Fluttermane, Waterfall almost KOs Great Tusk, and they forfeit the next turn. With seven wins and two losses, I advance to day two. I get a few hours of sleep, but before I know it, it's time for the second day. There's five rounds, and at the end, the best eight players advance to the final bracket. I sit down to play my first match of the day and take a look at my opponent's team. Oh, it is so doomed. The game starts, and it's Fluttermane and Espathra against Ndidi and Armourouge. I go for Hypnosis and Substitute. I hit the Armourouge, who went for Terra Grass, as Ndidi sets Trick Room. Armourouge stays asleep, and Luminacrash and Moonblast KO it. With the Pokemon lead, I'm able to stall Trick Room and force Dendozo in, being careful to preserve Espathra. When the time is right, I hit Dendozo with Lumina Crash, and from there, it's easy enough to win. But game two goes far, far worse. The leads are the same, only this time, Hypnosis misses. Once again, my opponent didn't go for Follow Me, so Expanding Force and Trick Room do huge damage to Espathra and break the substitute. I protect Espathra and go for a Terra Steel substitute as my opponent goes for Follow Me and Expanding Force. I get the sub up, but I haven't done any damage. It looks like Espathra will survive another Expanding Force, so I go for Protect and Hypnosis. Follow Me comes out, and Espathra survives the Expanding Force, but Hypnosis misses again. There's two turns of Trick Room left, I've done zero damage, my Espathra is nearly gone, my Terra is burnt, and my Flutter Main is low HP. I'm tempted to forfeit. My position is so bad. I play on though, and I burn the penultimate turn of Trick Room by protecting both my Pokemon. Then I switch to Gyarados and Moonblast as they expanding force and follow me again. Trick Room finally ends, but I can't stop it from going up again. Instead, I go for Substitute and Waterfall. My opponent goes for follow me and Trick Room, and Ndidi survives. Suddenly, I see it. The one way I can claw myself back into this game. Psychic Terrain is gone, meaning Expanding Force is no longer overpowered. If my opponent wants to break my Substitute, they need to use Armor Cannon and drop their defenses. Gyarados is super low HP, so I obviously want to protect it. 
so they probably think that follow me and armor cannon is a really safe play but if i get this read correct i can potentially ko both pokemon this turn the turn begins and indeedy uses follow me armor cannon comes out and breaks the substitute lowering armor rouge's defenses waterfall finishes off indeedy and shadow ball takes out armor rouge suddenly i'm up four against two but I'm still gonna lose. The final two Pokemon are Dendozo and Tatsugiri. My opponent still has Terra Grass available, and my Pokemon are super low HP. I go for Waterfall and Moonblast, and I get the flinch that I'm looking for, but this combined attack only does about 15% after Leftovers healing. It's the last turn of Trick Room, and I hope that they want to target Fluttermane, so I protect and switch to Sandy Shocks. But they go for a substitute. I know they want to target Fluttermane, as Sandy Shocks can't do anything to Grass Dendozo. So I go for an Earth Power, and I sacrifice Gyarados to Dendozo. If I don't get a Spothra on the field at the exact right moment, I'll definitely lose. I predict my opponent to read my Protect, and instead to target Sandy Shocks. Earth Power doesn't break the sub, but Moonblast does. And Dendozo aims a wave crash at Sandy Shocks, KOing it. As Pothra and Fluttermane are all I have left against Dendozo and Tatsugiri. Hoping for a Protect or attack into Fluttermane, I go for Lumina Crash and Substitute, dropping Fluttermane to 14 HP. My opponent sees through my play and KOs as Pothra. It's a 1 against 2 now. Moonblast doesn't KO Dendozo, and Dendozo is able to break the Substitute. I protect to get one last turn of Leftovers Recovery, and then Moonblast to KO Dendozo. Focus Sash Tatsugiri is the final boss. I protect, healing up just a little more. I go for Moonblast. Tatsugiri drops to 1 HP, and the special attack falls. Muddy Water connects, but Fluttermane easily survives. I think this one's sealed up, until I see something horrible. Fluttermane's accuracy was dropped. This means that my previously 100% accurate moves are only 75% accurate now. In other words, I'll lose this game a quarter of the time. Or will I? Three minutes remain. This battle has gone on for so long that we're almost out of time. I see a way to win without relying on accuracy. I wait 45 seconds and protect. I wait 45 seconds and use substitute. I wait 45 seconds and click protect. Time has run out. The battle has ended. I emerge the victor. Unfortunately, because that last game took so long, there's no break before the next round. And the matchup is tricky. It's Dendozo and Tatsugiri once again, but paired with a Fluttermane with Parish Song, a Sylveon with Psych Up, and a Terra Grass Assault Vest Seraledge. The basic strategy here is to use Parish Song with Fluttermane on Tatsugiri, then switch in Dendozo and stall until the Parish timer hits zero. This will KO Tatsugiri inside Dendozo's mouth and allow you to bring in a new Pokemon alongside it while retaining your boosts. I lose game one pretty convincingly. The combination of Icy Wind Fluttermane and Terra Grass Seraledge makes it really difficult for me to position, and though I eventually make some headway, I've burned too many resources to deal with Dendozo. I can still win if I hit a Hypnosis, but I miss and I lose the game. For game two, we both adapt. I lead off with Seraledge and Fluttermane against my opponents Tatsugiri and Fluttermane. I make an aggressive turn one play, doubling into Tatsugiri as they protect and Moonblast. I realize with this play that I'm pretty far behind, so I predict the Dendozo to switch in and Bitterblade the Fluttermane instead, dropping it to low HP. I predict Fluttermane switching out for Tatsugiri, so I substitute and switch to Gyarados. From here, all I need is to get a Spothra in safely, and I can clear Dendozo. Once Dendozo goes down, my substitute Fluttermane easily cleans up the game. It's all down to game 3. I really want to lead with Seraledge and Fluttermane for game 3, but I have this intuition. If I lead these two Pokemon, I'll lose. I try and figure out another pair. Should I leave Sandy Shocks behind again? Should I conserve my Terra for Gyarados in case of the Terra Grass Seraledge? What happens if they go for the Parish mode and try to use Sylveon for the first time? And then, all of a sudden, I notice something. I only have three seconds left to choose my Pokemon. Panicking, I frantically lock in a Spothra and try and select Fluttermane, but it's too late. The timer hits zero and the game auto-picks my Pokemon for me. Espothra, Tinkaton, Gyarados, and Seraled. None of these Pokemon can beat Dendozo. I play aggressively, doing big damage to my opponent's Glamora and Seraled lead, but Dendozo and Tatsugiri hit the field. I need to hit a Hypnosis in order to win. I miss. I can still win if Waterfall flinches. It doesn't. If Seraled lands a critical hit, I may still be able to bring this back. <sighs> it doesn't. I lose the game and the set. I can't remember the last time I timed out in Team Preview, if ever. It's a really stupid way to lose, and I can't shake the feeling of regret. But with three rounds left to play, there is still a chance of hope. 
And my next matchup is very in my favor, the exact type of team that Tinkaton and Gyarados demolish. I go for Fake Out and Substitute as they Terrastalize Garchomp to fire and set up Tailwind. These Pokemon can't do anything to Gyarados, who comes in for free, and with the combination of Tinkaton, Fluttermane, and Gyarados, I take out Talonflame and wear down the Garchomp. The last two Pokemon are Tyranitar and Iron Bundle. I take out the Bundle with Moonblast, but the game suddenly becomes very close as Tinkaton misses a Thunder Wave. I try and KO Tyranitar with Gigaton Hammer, but I get flinched by Rock Slide. Gyarados finishes off Terrifier Garchomp, and the game is decided by whether or not Tinkaton flinches again. It doesn't, and Gigaton Hammer wins the game. The second game is a lot less close. I step up my play, weaving together obvious switches and roundabout switches in a way that's impossible to predict. The matchup is too heavily in my favor, and I win without incident. My penultimate opponent is unfortunately a friend who I'm staying with this weekend. The good news is the matchup is similar to the last one, and thus very in my favor. The game is close, with me getting an early lead with Sarah Ledge and Gyarados, only for my opponent to claw it back by using Terra Ice Freeze Dry to KO my plus one speed Terra Flying Gyarados. I've done enough work though, and my Flutter Main is able to clean up. The second game features a big adjustment from both of us, with my opponent bringing both Gothitelle and Tyranitar, and me switching up my final Pokemon to be a Spothra, not Tinkaton. The battle goes back and forth, with Tyranitar causing problems early and Sarah Ledge causing issues towards the middle. In the end, saving Focus Sash's Spothra till the end is the tool I need to win the set. I sit down for the final round, and I take a look at a familiar team. My team. The very same Iron Jugulus one that I already lost to earlier in this tournament. Will I get a chance at redemption, or am I going to lose to my own team again? Jugulus and Goldengo stare down Flutter Mane and Theraledge. I go for Protect and Bitter Blade, but my opponent goes for Snarl and Shadow Ball, and KOs my Theraledge. I'm a little shocked they went for a play like that, since if I Terra Grass, they probably just lost immediately. I go into Sandy Shocks, and I use Terra Electric Thunderbolt to try and KO Jugulus, but it just barely survives something I didn't even know was possible. I need to take a risk, and I leave Fluttermane vulnerable in front of Goldengo. But my opponent doesn't take the bait and instead KOs Fluttermane. With only Sandy Shocks and Gyarados left, I can't win. But I know how to win game two. As I expected, the leads are the same, and my opponent makes the same turn one. This time, however, I go for Protect and Terra Grass Bitter Blade killing all the damage I take and nearly KOing Goldengo. I finish off Goldengo with Shadow Sneak as they set up Tailwind, and I drop Jugulus to 10% with Moonblast. Great Tusk comes out. Switching Fluttermane into Gyarados is obvious, so I instead switch Sarah Ledge into Gyarados, but my opponent goes for Snarl and Close Combat into their own Jugulus? They likely predicted I would protect and switch, and wanted to get Iron Bundle in freely, but it totally backfires, and my Flutter KOs their Tusk. Down 4-1, to one, they forfeit. It's the final game. I don't want to make that same gamble on turn one again, as if they go for Air Slash and make it rain, I can still lose Sarah Ledge. So I decide to lead with Sandy Shocks and Sarah Ledge this time. I spot a cheeky play, and I go for Shadow Sneak and Earth Power to quickly KO Goldengo before it can move. And all I take is a Snarl for my trouble. I switch to Gyarados and Thunderbolt the Jugulus, as they go for Air Slash and Headlong Rush into the Sarah Ledge slot, attempting to cover my Terra Grass. Thunderbolt after a Snarl did around 55% to Jugulus, so I'm relatively certain that another will KO. With this, I can Waterfall or Dragon Dance and put myself in a near guaranteed winning position. Except, the second Thunderbolt doesn't KO the Jugulus, and Tailwind goes up. Suddenly, things are looking really bad. Great Tusk KOs Sandy Shocks, and I try to KO Great Tusk with Waterfall, but Air Slash flinches me. Things are slipping, and fast. Sarah Ledge comes out, and Shadow Sneak KOs Jugulus. They close combat Sarah Ledge, predicting a Terrastalization, but I don't take the bait. And finally, Waterfall KOs Great Tusk. Left with only Iron Bundle, they cannot beat Fluttermane, and I win the set. Now for the most nerve-wracking part of the tournament, the results. Several players with my record of 11 wins and 3 losses will advance onto the final 8 players. The tiebreaker in Pokemon is something called resistance, which aims to account for how good your opponents were, but for some reason, only your day 2 opponents count. So a player who goes 9 wins, 0 losses day 1, and then 2 wins, 3 losses day 2, will only count as if they won 2 games. It's a strange system, but it's the one we're working with. The standings go up and I see that I finished 13th. There were 12 players who had 11 wins and three losses. Three advanced to the top eight, eight finished in the top 16, and one player finished in the top 32. This is a difference of potentially thousands of dollars, as well as a large number of points needed to qualify for the world championships. 
So I didn't win the tournament, but I do think that I proved that a number of these Pokemon are a lot better than most people gave them credit for. Thanks for watching and don't forget to check out Holes Current using the link in the description.